Chag Sameach, Yom Tura Sameach, Happy Yom Tura. Yes, excellent. So this is this is this is the day. I mean, we're in it, Nehemi. According to Scripture, this is it. We're in we're this, in Yom Tura. The first day of the seventh month. Many people will be familiar with this in the Jewish world as Rosh Hashanah, which means the head of the year, or New Year. But actually, that term Rosh Hashanah doesn't appear anywhere in the Tanakh. In the Tanakh, the festival or the holiday is called Yom Tura, the day of trumpets or the day of tr- shouting. We'll talk about what Tura means. We'll get to that. Can we can we jump to the book of Nehemiah, chapter 7? In the English, it's verse 73. In the Hebrew, it's verse 72. Mm-hmm. So the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, some of the people, the temple servants, and all Israel settled in their towns. This is the ingathering of the first exile. When the seventh month came, the people of Israel being settled in their towns, all the people gathered together in the square before the water gate. So they're in this public square. They told the scribe Ezra to bring the book of the Torah of Moses, mm. which Jehovah had given to Israel. I get chills. Keith, he brought this Torah with him back from Babylon. And now he's going to un- unroll it and read it for the first time to the people who have gathered. They've been in exile for 70 years. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there are people like Daniel in the exile mm-hmm. who were, um, you know, people like Daniel in the exile who were, who were, who were, you know, hearing the Torah. But then most people in the exile probably didn't have a great access to the Torah. Mm-hmm. Um and accordingly, the priest Ezra brought the law before the assembly. That's the Torah mm. before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could hear with understanding. This was on the first day of the seventh month. That's today. That's Yom Tura. Mm-hmm. So the first day of the seventh month, he read from it, facing the square before the water gate from the early morning until midday. Mm-hmm. In the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the uh, book of the Torah. Verse 4. The scribe Ezra stood on a wooden platform that had been made for the purpose, and besides him stood Matityahu, Shema, and Anayah, Uriah, Chilkiah, and Masiah in his right hand, and Padayah, Mishael, Malchiah, Chashum, Chash, Badana, Zechariah, Meshulam on his left hand. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of of all the people, for he was standing above the people. And we opened it, all the people stood up. Well, that's interesting. So they're Mm -hmm. standing up in honor of the Torah. Um, and Ezra opened the book and said of all the people, okay, verse 6, that Ezra blessed Jehovah, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands, Amen, Amen. Amen. Then they bowed their heads and worshipped Jehovah with their faces to the ground. Also Yeshua and Bani and Sherevia on the right. Akuv, Shabtai, Hodea, Masaya, Klita, Zaya, these are different priests or leaders or Levites. Yozavad, Hanan, and Playa, and the Levites, uh, and the Levites helped the people understand the Torah while the people remained in their places. And there's a question what does that mean they helped them understand or they caused them to understand? Mm-hmm. A good question. We'll leave that for a different discussion. So they read from the book of the Torah of God with, and it says here in this translation, with interpretation. Mm-hmm. And what it literally says in Hebrew is miforash, clearly, mm. unequivocally. They gave the sense to the people so that the people understood the reading. And, the, and what does that mean? And, and there's different explanations of that. I don't know that we're going to get into that now, but um, let's go on. Uh, one explanation is that they, that, that actually is, is um, just the intonation you use. So mm-hmm. if it says in the Torah, you shall not murder, what it literally says is, no, you will murder. Lo tirzach. And you could read that as a rhetorical question. Lo tirzach, which means... Shall you not murder? You're, of course you'll murder. <laughs> right? So the very fact that I read it, lo tzach, I read it as an imperative, as a commandment, that itself is giving the meaning. Okay, going on. Uh, and it also is possible they were in Babylon for 70 years. They came back. The dialect of Hebrew they spoke in uh, this period was slightly different than the Hebrew of the Torah. And how do we know that? Just read the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. It's a different dialect of Hebrew. Mm-hmm. Um and Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra, the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, this is the key part for our discussion, this day is holy to Jehovah your God. Do not mourn or weep. Mm-hmm. Now, why would they mourn or weep? For all the people wept when they heard the words of the Torah. Amen. Why were they weeping, Keith? Amen. Well, because they were under conviction. <laughs> they had heard. 
don't don't uh, worship idols mm -hmm. don't pray to the dead they're like we've been praying to the dead for 70 years in babylon and whatever mm -hmm. else they were doing i don't know exactly right mm -hmm. but they were they didn't know all these commandments that they were supposed to follow and they heard this is god's will for mankind mm -hmm. for for israel to share with the world and we haven't been doing it we've been shirking our responsibilities mm -hmm. so they wept mm -hmm. goes on in verse 10 then he then he said to them go your way eat the fat and drink sweet wine and literally it says, eat mashmanim, fat food, ushtumam takim, and drink sweet drinks, and send portions of them to those for whom nothing is prepared. For, in other words, to poor people. For this day is holy to our to Yehovah. Oh, actually, it says to our Lord. Um, and do not be grieved for the day, uh, for the joy of Yehovah is your strength. What a beautiful statement. The day of Yehovah is your, uh, the joy of Yehovah is your strength. Mm -hmm. So the Levites stilled all the people saying, be quiet for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. Yes. And all their people went to eat and drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicing because they'd understood the words that were declared to them. Think about this. It's Yom Turah. They might not even know it's Yom Turah. They're hearing in Leviticus the way we're hearing in Leviticus and in Numbers about this holiday. And maybe that's all they know. Imagine mm -hmm. you're standing there on the first day of the seventh month and you hear the following in the book of Leviticus, mm -hmm. chapter 23, verse 24, mm -hmm. and you get this little surprise. It says, uh, verse 23, it starts, and Yehovah spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel saying, in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, Yelechem Shabbaton shall be for you a time of rest. Zichron Tula, which in the NRSV is translated, uh, uh, commemorated with trumpet blasts. Mm -hmm. JPS or NIV here is a, a sacred assembly commemorated with trumpet blasts. They pull up the JPS here, the Jewish translation, a sacred occasion commemorated with loud blasts. We're going to return to what that means. Yes. So it's a Mikra Kodesh, a holy convocation or proclamation, which is Zichron Trua, a Zichron of Trua. Mm -hmm. What is Trua? It's Yom Trua. We'll get to that in a minute. You shall not do any manner of work, uh, and you shall offer a fire offering to Yehovah. And then the next time you hear about it is Numbers 29, verse 1. And of all the feasts we have in the Tanakh, um, or in the Torah, I should say, this is the one we hear the least about. Mm -hmm. um, you could say maybe Shemini Atzeret, right? But that's part of Sukkot, or the cycle of Sukkot. But here we have two references in the entire Torah to this feast. Mm -hmm. We have uh, Pesach, we have numerous references. We have Exodus 12, Exodus 23, 34, Numbers 9, Leviticus 23, Numbers 28, and Deuteronomy um, Deuteronomy 16. It's seven references to Pesach. Mm -hmm. Yom Kippur, we have a whole chapter in Leviticus 16 on Yom Kippur, mm -hmm. in addition to what we hear in Leviticus 23 and Numbers 29. Uh, here we have two references, and here's the second one. On the first day, there's Numbers 29, 1. On the first day of the seventh month, you shall have a holy convocation, you shall not work at your occupations at the NRSV. It says you shall do no laborious work. Mm -hmm. It is a Yom Truah for you, a day of Truah. Mm -hmm. So that's all we know about Yom Truah in the entire Tanakh yeah. is the three, really the three passages. We read one about them, one about it in um, in, Nich, in the book of Nehemiah, but didn't even tell us there that it's Yom Truah. Uh, it just says, you know, this is a day of that's holy to Yehovah. And then we have, um, we have, you know, Leviticus 23 and Numbers 29. And that's it. That's all we know about Yom Tirah. Something that I really appreciated about uh, the passage that you had us read. Um, yeah. I was thinking mm -hmm. about Ezra for a second. And so you have Ezra, of course, the book right before in our English Bible here. But there's a, there's a verse in Ezra <clears throat> that kind of gives reason for why he would be the one that would do what he's doing in the book of Nehemiah. And it's in chapter 7, verse 10. And it says this, For Ezra had set his heart to study the Torah of Yehovah and to practice it and to teach his statutes and ordinances in Israel. And I've always kind of, Nehemiah used that as kind of a model. It says that he would study it and then practice it and then teach it. So why is that? Wow. I want to bring that up before we go any further is because Yom Turah for me is my favorite holiday, holy day. And the reason is, has to do with um, something that you and I actually have experienced, which was learning and understanding it for myself 
and then practicing the idea of looking for the sign that would let us know that this is Yom Teruah. So here's an obvious question for you, my friend. So yeah. how do we know it's uh, Yom Teruah? What's, you know, I know there's a lot of people listening. You guys are the know-it-alls. Oh, you guys got all the information. Because there was somebody saying, said the new moon saying in Israel. There's a bunch of people that we invited to this uh, particular, particular event who don't have as much background. So can we back up a little bit about how we would know that this is uh, the day to celebrate? So, so like I said, there are people in Israel who cited the new moon mm -hmm. and that was put out. Uh, Devorah's date tree made the announcement. Mm -hmm. um, and we had more than one. We had at least two witnesses and the new moon was cited. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. oh, it's the seventh month from the beginning of the year. Okay. So, and that was actually really interesting. I was discussing the, this this morning with someone and we read what we're about. Well, we just actually the same exact thing as we just read here, Leviticus 23, 24. Mm -hmm. and, and the response was, well, wait a minute. I, I, and this was someone who doesn't have a great background in, in, in Jewish culture. So the person's response was, I thought this was the beginning of the year, but it says here it's the seventh month. <laughs> <laughs> well, see. the whole idea of Rosh Hashanah is something that doesn't appear anywhere in the Tanakh. That's an idea the Jews brought back with them from Babylon. The rabbis actually admit that this is something that is not, um, well, they don't exactly admit it's not core to the Torah, but here's what they do admit. In the Mishnah of Rosh Hashanah, the first passage says there are four new years. Why do they say there's four new years? Because they understand that the um, that the new year uh, of the I mean the new year counted um, as the first day of the of the first month. That that's actually the primary new year, and the, so they call well they say that's the new year of months, mm -hmm. right? So here's what they really did: they took the Babylonian uh, uh, or Persian New Year, and they because uh, the Babylonians had a similar calendar. And the, their new year, though, is in the first day of the seventh month instead of the first day of the first month. And they call that month uh, Tishrei. So the first Tishrei was the Babylonian New Year. And they adopted that new year, but they didn't invalidate the, the Torah New Year. So here's what it says in Mishnah Rosh Hashanah 1 1. There are four new years. The first of Nisan, meaning the first month, is the new year for kings and for festivals. So why do they say for festivals? Because we read in Leviticus 23 and Numbers 28 and 29, and it says the first month and the seventh month, right? You have to acknowledge that for counting the festivals, that that's the, that the first day of the first month, and really it's actually the first commandment in the Torah. Exodus chapter 12, verse 2 is the first commandment in the Torah to Israel as a people, uh, and that commandment is, this month, new moon is for you, the beginning of new moons. Mm -hmm. So they acknowledge that it's the new moon for the festivals. They go on, the first of El is the new year of the tithes for the tithes of beasts. Um, the first of Tishrei is the new year for the years for Shemitah, that is the sabbatical cycle and Jubilee years, for planting and for tithes of vegetables. The first of Shvat is the new year for trees. Okay. Um, so they have four new years. What do they mean the new year for trees? That's, that's an agricultural maybe celebration or observance mm -hmm. that may have existed in ancient Israel. It's not even hinted at anywhere in the Tanakh. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's part of the ancient Israelite culture, but it's not part of the Torah that the creator of the universe gave to mankind. So here's so, the idea of, of, of Rosh Hashanah being the first of Tishrei, the first of the seventh month, is completely contrary to what we read in the Torah. Hey, I want to talk about the meaning of Truah. Okay. So if it's not Rosh Hashanah, what's the holiday called? We saw in Numbers 29.1, it's called Yom Teruah, the day of Teruah. And Leviticus 23.24, is called Zichron Teruah, the uh, memorial of Teruah, or the mentioning of Teruah. The actual meaning of Zichron is, uh, we, it, it comes from the word Zachar, mm -hmm. uh, Lahazkir. Lahazkir is to mention. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of people say, well, wait a minute, Zachar is to remember. So in ancient Hebrew, biblical Hebrew, this word meant both to remember something and to mention it with your lips. Mm -hmm. And how could it mean both? Well, it's the idea of summoning it up. You can summon it up with your lips by speaking it, or you can summon it up in your mind by thinking about it, by remembering it. So it's an active memory, summing it up in the memory. And then that's what God meant in Exodus 3.15. He says, this is my name forever. This is my zecher for every generation. Mm -hmm. And some people translate it, this is my memorial for every generation. That we're not to use God's name anymore. We're just supposed to remember it. That's not what it means at all. Quite the contrary. He meant, this is my mention for every generation. Mm -hmm. When you mention me, this is what you're, how you're supposed to refer to me as Yehovah. 
And then Exodus 20, 24, he says, every place where I cause my name to be mentioned, Mm-hmm. In every place where Azkir et Shemi, where I met, cause my name to mention, I will come to you and bless you. Mm-hmm. And Zichron Truah, that word Zichron may be, a, I think it is, it's, it's a term that refers to mentioning God's name. In other words, this term Zachar uh, took on a technical sense of to mention the name of a God. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I say a God because there's a commandment not to mention the names of other gods. And it, and it has that same exact word Zachar. And here in the context of the God of Israel commanding us to have a zikron trua, mm-hmm. we're supposed to trua his name. Uh, and what, we haven't defined what trua is, though. <laughs> we're mm-hmm. supposed to trua his name, to mention his name. Mm-hmm. So let's find out what trua means. Mm-hmm. In, in rabbinical Judaism, trua has a very clear meaning. It means to blow a shofar mm-hmm. and nothing else. Mm-hmm. I want to see what it means from the Tanakh, though. Mm-hmm. So let's start. We'll go really quick through these different passages. Leviticus chapter 25, verse 9. And there it's talking not about Yom Truah. It's talking about Yom Kippur and specifically the Jubilee year, the 50th year. You count seven years, and that's a sabbatical year, a Shemitah. And then you count seven Shemitahs, that's 49 years. And then the 50th year is the Yovel, the Jubilee year. What is the meaning of the word Jubilee? Has anybody stopped to ask that? What is the meaning of Jubilee, Keith? Well, for me, I know what it means. Isn't it like you have like a gold plate or a silver plate or something like that? Silver you mean the jubilee? English? You mean the English meaning or the Hebrew? Meaning? What is the English meaning? Let's start with that. So jubilee is like the idea of celebrating over a period of time. It's the jubilee. It's a uh, it's a it's a period of time. So the Hebrew word yovel means an antelope. Yep. It literally means an antelope. And so, what is the meaning? What what's the significance of the jubilee year? They blow. They would proclaim the, the the year on Yom Kippur with an antelope horn. Mm-hmm. And here I have a shofar, but it's a specific type of shofar. Most uh, Jews, when they think of a shofar, they think of this. This is the ram's horn. Mm-hmm. This is from a domesticated animal. I actually have a little one over here. This is my little, uh, uh, <laughs> my, my little uh, ram. Got this to illustrate. Um, everything is backwards on my screen, so I hope I'm doing this right. It's working good. Uh, so, they, so this is inverted on, on the camera. So, so this is a ram's horn. It attaches here, and uh, people blow on the shofar. Okay, I'm not very good at this little one. However, this one comes from an animal called an Arabian oryx. Uh, well, frankly, this one probably comes from a gemsbach which is a type of oryx. But in, in the animal that's indigenous to Israel is this little guy. He's called the Arabian oryx, in Hebrew, the re'em. Uh, re'em is often translated in the Tanakh as, an, as, a, um, as a unicorn. <laughs> <laughs> I once had actually somebody say, how can you say you believe in the Bible if you don't believe in unicorns? And I'm like, what are you talking about? He showed <laughs> me in the King James Version where re'em was translated unicorn. I said, that's not a unicorn. That's, a, that's an Arabian oryx. From the side, it might look like a unicorn, but no, it's not. So this is the shofar, uh, and this is a yovel. When it says they blew on a yovel, it was it could have been this, or it could have been a different type, which comes from an animal called a kudu. A kudu is an animal known from South Africa, but it also exists in uh, southern Arabia. Uh, may have extended to Israel at some time, but even if it didn't, they would have traded in these from southern Arabia and eastern Africa. Keith, you're famous for blowing on the kudu shofar. Yes, I love it. C- can you can you blow on the shofar, or, or we're gonna get that I'm gonna later? Wait to blow on the shofar. Uh, kudu shofar. Jews will often refer to these as a Yemenite shofar mm-hmm. because in Yemen, this is the shofar they used usually, uh, or often at least, because they had access to these. If you were living in Morocco, there weren't a whole lot of uh, of kudus, so you uh, usually use something like this, right? Or if you were in Eastern Europe, you use something like this from a domesticated ram. Okay. We're going to blow on the shofar a little bit later. I'm going to let you toot your own horn, Keith. But this, <laughs> both this and this are called a yovel, a jubilee. Um, now, uh, Numbers chapter 10, verses 5 and 6. Uh, I want to read those passages because what we're doing here is we're saying, okay, we know what tradition tells us that trua means. Trua is blowing on a shofar. Let's see what the Tanakh reveals through the Hebrew language, through the ancient Hebrew language, as, me, as the meaning of, of Truah. Mm-hmm. So, 
verse 5 says, when you blow an alarm, and literally it says, when you blow a truah, mm -hmm. uh, the camps on the east side shall set out. When you blow a second truah, mm -hmm. the camp on the south side shall set out. And then it says, a truah is to be blown when it, whenever they are to set out. So you can blow a shofar on a jubilee, on an antelope horn, uh, which is a type of shofar. You can also do it on what's called a chatzotzla. And chatzotzla is what's described in Numbers chapter 10. Numbers 10 is not a shofar. Mm. Numbers 10 is a silver trumpet. Verse 2, make two silver trumpets. You shall make them of hammered work. And you shall use them for summoning the congregation for breaking camp. Right? So the truah can be made both on a ram's horn. On, well, actually, we haven't seen ram's horn yet. We've seen an uh, antelope horn. On antelope horns, it could also be made on um, on a... Uh, on a, a silver trumpet. So that's two types of truah. There's another type of truah in Judges chapter 6, verse 5. Judges 6, 5. Um, it's describing the Israelites walking around Jericho. They did this for seven days. For they and their livestock would come up and they would even bring their tents as thick as locusts. Neither do their camels could be counted. I'm in Judges 6, 5. Sorry, instead of Joshua 6, 5. <laughs> Joshua 6, 5. When they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and that's a completely incorrect translation, because what does the Hebrew say in Judge, Joshua 6, 5? It doesn't say ram's horn in that part of the verse. It says, in the, with the horn of the jubilee, with the horn of the antelope. <laughs> Literally says it shall come to pass when the horn of the antelope is elongated. Right, meaning the the sound of the uh, of the meaning. What does that mean? You don't just blow the shofar, but you do a really long one. What they call today tragdola. I don't know that I can do it with my asthma. I'll give it a try. No. <laughs> okay. No walls of Jericho were coming down to my <laughs> So here it says, when they make a long blast with the with the horn of the Yovel, as soon as you hear the sound of the shofar, so shofar appears in that verse. Mm -hmm. NRSV translates that as a, a trumpet. There's all this confusion. JPS, if when a long blast is sounded on the horn, as soon as you hear that sound of the horn. So from JPS, you would have no idea that it's specifically talking about a Yovel, the horn of a Yovel, of, a, of an antelope. Uh, and that there's another word there, which is the word shofar, because it's a type of shofar. Um, then it says, mm -hmm. The entire nation shall shout a great shout. Mm -hmm. So tra is a shout. Mm -hmm. Now, here's a really interesting point. If you look at the Targum, which is the ancient Jewish translation in Aramaic of the word tra, it has the word yavava. It says, Ye yavavun kol ama yavava. The entire people shall yavav a yavava. What is yavava? Yavav is the Hebrew or the Aramaic word as well, the Hebrew and Aramaic word for to cry. Mm -hmm. So the, the meaning of tra is understood as something like crying. Mm -hmm. So what exactly does that mean, crying? <coughs> We're going to come back to that. Um, okay. Uh, and it's a beautiful verse that we're going to see in, in Ezra, that, or in, in Nehemiah, um, that, or no, it's in Ezra, that really illustrates that. So that was Joshua 6, 5, and then again in verse 20, the same thing happens. 1 Samuel 4, 5 to 6, the crowd at the, ar entering of the, of the, at the ark entering the camp is shouting with the truah. 2 Samuel 6, 15, I want to look at that because that is, and again, what we're doing here is asking the question, not what does this mean in tradition, we have this ancient text that's a thousand pages long, the Tanakh. How did people use this word? We can tell the meaning of the word by the way it was used. Yes. It says, and da thus David and all the house of Israel brought the ark of Jehovah with truah and with the sound of the shofar. Those are two different things in, in 2 Samuel 6.15. So what is truah here? It's not the sound of the shofar. It's the sound of the people, just like at Jericho. Mm. Now, the sound of the shofar can be truah. We saw that in Leviticus 25. But truah can also be shouting. That's why I translate Yom Truah not as day of trumpets, which it definitely doesn't mean. 
You could translate it if you want a day of bl- show of of horn blasts, um, or but I translate a day of shouting. But if we're really if we really want to give the, the 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 full definition, tra is a loud noise, a loud noise that sounds like a big crowd of people crying. How do I know that? We'll see. We're not there yet. Okay. So that was 2 Samuel 6.15. Psalms 150, verse 5. <laughs> so far we've seen what we've seen three different meanings of tra. We saw number one, it's uh the blast of an antelope horn, it is the blast of a silver trumpet, and it is the shout of the people. Mm-hmm. And it's compared to crying in the Aramaic. Um, and by the way, even the silver trumpets was described in the Aramaic as Yavavta, mm-hmm. as, as crying. So is it a sad crying? Because crying can be sad. We'll see whether it's sad or not. Psalm 150, verse 5. And I love this psalm because, first of all, Psalm 150 is the end of the, of the fifth book of Psalms. Psalms is divided in Hebrew into five books. And this is a, a, what we call a doxology, a praise, a blessing that ends the entire book, not just this psalm. So let's read the whole psalm. Hallelujah. Praise Yah. Halu el bekodsho, halu bilkia uzo. Praise God in the sanctuary. Praise Him in the sky, His stronghold. Praise Him for His mighty acts. Praise Him for His exceeding greatness. Praise Him with the blasts of the horn, is what it says in the JPS. The Hebrew says, Hallelujah, praise Him with the blowing of the shofar. So you could take the shofar, and there could be this. It doesn't say what type of shofar, or meaning a, a domesticated ram's horn. Or it could be a, uh, a Arabian oryx or a kudu. It could be any of these, and there are other animals in Israel potentially could be um, other types of antelope. Um, these are the most common certainly today. Um, and you you can praise God by blowing the shofar. I'm going to ask you to do that in a, in, in a minute, okay, Keith? Praise Him with drums and dancing. Praise Him with lute and pipe. Praise Him with and here in JPS, it says, with resounding cymbals, praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let all that breathe praise Yehovah. Hallelujah. Now I want to go back to verse 5, where it says, praise him with resounding cymbals, praise him with loud clashing cymbals. What are these cymbals? Are these like what we think of as cymbals? I don't think so. Um, the word there is tzilsel. B'tzilsele shama, b'tzilsele trua. Um, oh, and here's the important point. Tzilzalim of Trua. So there's a type of Trua made by Tzilzalim. What are Tzilzalim? Tzilzalim, it's actually what we call an onomatopoeia. Most words in every language in existence are considered to have nothing to do with the object they describe. Hmm. What do I mean by that? There's nothing about the word dog in English or kelev in Hebrew that tells me anything inherently about the about a dog. It's an arbitrary... Uh, term that's been applied to dog there are exceptions and the most common major exception is what we call onomatopoeia onomatopoeia is this idea that the word the the thing you're describing sounds like the word salim is an onomatopoeia it's some noise that sounds like and one of the ways of making it through is with some musical instrument that makes it sealed cell now what is that musical instrument I can say with great confidence that it's not cymbals. It's what's called a percussion egg. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to get a percussion egg. How do I know it's a percussion egg? What is a percussion egg? It's like those like cucaracha things, right? So I have here tambourine. So tambourine makes a similar sound. That's a tilt cell, tilt cell. But, but, but what it's describing more than likely here is something that has been found in archaeological excavations, uh, in the excavations up against the wall of the Temple Mount that were carried out in the late 60s, 1968, by Benjamin Mazar. He found these, what we call today a percussion egg, and it's a a round thing that kind of looks like an egg. In the case of ancient Israel, in in the excavations, it was made of pottery, and it's filled with little pottery balls. And you shake, and it goes... And that's the sound, sil, 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 sil. So one of the ways of making the sound of tura and yom tura is with a percussion egg, or I'm going to use in this case my uh, tambourine. Wow. 
This is no less legitimate a way of making tra than to blow on the shofar and to say, hallelujah, praise Yehovah. All of those, and a silver trumpet, which I don't have, all of those in the biblical Tanakh sense are ways of making trua. And when we hear about zichron trua, which is zichron is to mention the name of God. So we can mention his name with a shout, Yehovah! Or we can blow on the shofar. You do it much more beautifully than I do, where your shofar actually makes, actually sings Yehovah's name. But listen for his name in my blowing of the shofar. And I'll talk about why we have those different traditional ways of doing it in a minute. So that is the fourth way, Psalm 155, to do it with a percussion egg or with some kind of tambourine or cymbals. Uh, now, how do I know that this is actually something that is supposed to be joyous? Maybe, because this is what it's done. To, they've done today in Judaism. Every one of our festivals in the Tanakh, every one of our holy convocations has a historical or agri and or agricultural reason assigned to it. Why do we do Sukkot? It's the ingathering of the, of the crops from the fields and it, or from the outdoor areas of the fields or, and or, in this case, and, it is we dwelt in booths for seven days when we came out of Egypt. Yom Kippur is the Day of Atonement, right? What's Yom Teruah? So Yom Teruah, we're just told it's a zichron, a mentioning, a mentioning shout, a mentioning of God's name, apparently with this word zachar. But we're not really told what the purpose of that is. So maybe it's a sad day. If we didn't have the verse in Nehemiah that we read, chapter 8, we might think it's a sad day. And especially since the ancient Aramaic translation translates the word teruah as yivava, as a cry. Now, what does a cry sound like? So the ancient Jewish sources say there's different types of cries. I can say, ah! <laughs> So that's actually what the shofar sounds like in traditional blowing, is those three different sounds. One long blast, three short blasts, or a nine staccato blast. Now, I don't do nine. I'm, you know, I'm winging it here. And if you go to a synagogue, they actually do different combinations of those three types of crying. And it's supposed to sound like crying. But then we get to the question, is it crying for joy or is it crying for sadness? So Job 8.21 Mm -hmm. is our next clue. Job is talking to his friends, and there we read about God. We'll start in verse 20. Surely God does not despise the blameless. He gives no support to evildoers. He will yet fill your mouth with laughter and your lips with truah. So no question there. It's made with the mouth, the truah, and it's something that is happy, right? It's just like laughter in the verse. And he says, your enemies will be closed in disgrace, right? So there's a contrast there between you and your enemies, and bat and wicked people, uh, the tent of the wicked shall vanish. So there unequivocally in Job 8:21, trua can be made with the lips, and it is something that is joyous. It is a happy trua. Now, why does it we say it sounds like a cry? Because that's you know, because when you're happy, it can also sound like a cry. And that brings us to the next passage. Ezra 3, 11 to 13. I absolutely love this passage, Keith. Mm -hmm. Um it's describing the dedication of the second temple. Mm -hmm. They sang songs extolling and praising Yehovah. And then it quotes what they sang. For Kitov, Kinolam Chasdo, Al Yisrael, for he is good, his, his chesed, his steadfast love for Israel is eternal. All the people raised a great truah. Yes. Praising Yehovah, it says, mm -hmm. because the foundation of the house of Yehovah had been laid. So they're shouting a great trua. What does that mean? Do they do it with shofars? Apparently not. Verse 12. Many of the priests and Levites and the chief of the clan, the old men who had seen the first house, wept loudly at the sight of the founding of this house. Many others shouted, that is, they did trua joyously. It's, it says here, a joyous trua at the top of their voices. So you've got thousands of people, and some are weeping over the destruction of the first temple, and they've now 
been blessed to see the second temple built. And there's other people who are shouting with joy. And it says in verse 13 of Ezra 3, the people could not distinguish the shouts of joy from the people's weeping. For the people raised a great trua, a great shout, the sound of which could be heard from afar. Amen. So we've seen up until now that trua could be made in four different ways in the Tanakh. It could be made with a shofar, uh, in, in the Tanakh that tends to be a, 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 a antelope horn, um, a jubilee horn. It could be made with a tr silver trumpet. It could be made with uh, cymbals or some kind of um, maraca, some type of a tzeltzel, a, a noisemaker. Or it could be made with people shouting, and it's a shouting of joy. Amen. That's what true is. And everybody out there, I want you to ask to sit with your family and your friends and ask this question when you're shouting to Yehovah, when you're blowing your shofar, letting it shout for you. What are the things that you're joyous about that you have to have a trua besimcha, a trua in, in joy rejoicing? And now I'm going to blow the shofar. <laughs> 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 I love it. You have been listening to Hebrew Voices with Nehemia Gordon. Thank you for supporting Nehemia's Makor Hebrew Foundation. Learn more at NehemiasWall.com.